The role of the kinsman redeemer or redeeming relative is outlined for us in the Old Testament. The book of Ruth powerfully illustrates the role of the kinsman redeemer as Boaz becomes the redeeming relative for Naomi and Ruth. Interestingly, the scriptures refer to God as our kinsman redeemer. In this sermon on Good Friday, we look at Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. We invite you to come under his wings so that you experience him as your personal kinsman redeemer. All right, good morning once again. Every year we have uh, this particular Friday set aside as Good Friday. We take time to remember what the Lord Jesus has done for us on the cross. And uh, I don't know in what mood you've come here. Sometimes uh, it can be a very, you know, a very sobering moment as, uh, as we take time to reflect on the cross and uh, think about the magnitude of Christ's sacrifice and suffering for us on the cross. Uh, that can be very, very sobering as we just ponder, as we reflect on that and uh, just try to understand, to whatever extent we can, how great a work God has done for us by sending His Son, Jesus, to die on that cross for us. But yet at the same time, looking at the cross can also be a sense of great joy, can also be a sense of great triumph. Uh, it fills our heart with thankfulness, gratitude, celebration that, hey, the work has been done. The work is finished, and uh, it was done 2,000 years ago, and today uh, we can enjoy the goodness of God, the benefits of Christ's work on the cross. And so, you know, the, a day like this, when we take time to reflect on the cross, meditate on the cross, can take us through all of these emotions, these reflection points, and, and all of this is good. It's important for us as we pause and ponder and think about what God has done. And then you find that this is, some, this is something that God wants his people to do. And if you look at the Old Testament, God instituted many days of observances, or what we call as festivals in the Old Testament. He told his people, you know, keep this day, remember what I did. Keep this day to remember what I did. You know, and so he kind of wanted his people to intentionally take time to remember, to think about what the Lord has done and what God has done in their journey of faith. And that's what we do every year as we, on Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. This, this, this does not mean that we don't think about the cross the other days. Of course, every day we do think about the cross and uh, we live uh, in the fullness of what Christ has done for us on the cross. Today, and uh, just to help us do that, to reflect on the cross of Jesus and what God has done for us through the cross, I want, to, I want us to meditate and think about one particular aspect of redemption, something that God introduced in the Old Testament, and which as we journey in our study, we will see that it consummated in what Christ did for us on the cross. That's the grand finale of what God started back in the Old Testament. It's the concept of kinsmen redeemer, or, you know, different versions would translate it and uh, uh, translate it differently. Uh, the New King James uses the term redeeming relative. Some versions would use kinsman, that means a close relative, kinsman redeemer, or redeeming relative. So this was actually introduced in the life of ancient Israel, uh, if we see this in the Old Testament, and really uh, to summarize what this involved, it had to do with 
if any person got into a trouble, so for instance, if a person got into financial difficulties and he had to sell his property or he underwent large, huge financial loss and so he ended up becoming a servant and, uh, you know, working as a servant, maybe even selling himself as a slave. If there was a close relative who had the capacity to buy back that property or purchase the freedom of his relative who, had to, who was in an unfortunate situation, then that closest relative would be referred to as the kinsman redeemer. And he would come in to help redeem his own family member and bring that person out of financial difficulty. So that was part of the community life of ancient Israel. There were other situations also where the kinsman redeemer had a role to play. Uh, one would be in avenging any kind of injustice. So if a close relative was wrongfully was killed, uh, about, you know, in whatever circumstances was killed, uh, then the close relative was called upon to avenge that injustice on the murderer, the person who uh, did the wrong. And a third situation where the kinsman redeemer uh, had a role to play was if in a family situation, the husband died, leaving, leaving his wife as a widow without children, then it became the responsibility of the next in line to the husband, the closest relative to the husband, to marry the widow. The idea was we, the widow shouldn't just be left like that or she, she need not go outside to search for somebody to take care of her. But somebody from within the family would step in and uh, marry her and you know, raise up a family uh, uh, in the place of the person who had passed away. And so these were scenarios or situations where the closest relative, the kinsman redeemer, kinsman would step in to redeem the situation, to redeem, to restore, to buy back, to bring into a place of honor and dignity what was otherwise a helpless and a hopeless situation. And God instituted that in the community life of ancient Israel. He said, practice this. And so, they did. And this is where the book of Ruth comes in. The book of Ruth, the Old Testament book of Ruth, is an amazing story of the kinsman redeemer. Of how the kinsman redeemer could transform the life and the experience of two people who otherwise were helpless and hopeless. The book of Ruth or the incidents in the book of Ruth occurred somewhere around 1500 to 1600 BC. That's the timeline most uh, Bible scholars would position the incident. That's when it happened in the time of the judges. So this was about a 400 year period, 400 uh, a 50 year period between the time from Joshua to Samuel. So there were 14 judges, excluding Eli and Samuel, who, who uh, administered or provided some sort of leadership to the people of Israel during that time. And it was somewhere in that period, at the time of the judges, that the incidents in the book of Ruth took place. Many of you are familiar with that story, but just to recap some of the incidents in that book. The Bible, the book of Ruth, Ruth talks about a man, a man named Elimelech and his wife Naomi. They were from Bethlehem. 
And they had two sons. And uh, during that time, which uh, probably, uh, like I mentioned, we don't know exactly which judge was in charge, but during that time, there was famine in the land. And so Elimelech took his wife Naomi and his two sons, and they journeyed southeast of Bethlehem into the region of, of Moab. And so they came into this place where there was enough food, and they spent about 10 years there. During that time, while they were in Moab, Elimelech died. His two sons married. They married women from among Moab. And uh, during that 10-year period, the two sons also died. So here you have three widows, Naomi, and the two women from Moab, Ruth and Orpha, three women, all widows. So here they are living in Moab, and during that time, Naomi gets news that things are better back home in Bethlehem. And so she decides to go back, to journey back to Bethlehem. Now we must keep something in mind about Moab. Who are these people? What do we know about Moab? Moab was actually... A son, or a son born to Lot, Abraham's relative. And he was born out, out of incest. Not a very nice way for a tribe to begin. And Moab, as the tribe increased around that region, became one of the great enemies of Israel. You remember the story in Numbers chapters 22 to 25 when Israel was actually journeying back or journeying towards the land of promise back into their land uh, when Balak, who was a king of Moab, wanted to curse Israel. So they weren't in good terms. Also in the book of Judges, Judges chapter 3, we read that for an 18-year period, the Moabites controlled and oppressed the people of Israel. So they were really bad. And also the Moabites themselves were idol worshippers. They worshipped their god, Chemosh, to whom they would worship through child sacrifice. I'm just giving a little background for us to understand that spiritually speaking, things were not so good, and also in terms of their social relations with Israel. And to make matters worse, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 3, here's what the Bible says. God said, an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever. God is saying, an Ammonite or a Moabite can never enter the house of the Lord. And Ruth was a Moabite. So when Naomi decides to go back to Bethlehem, she's got two daughters-in-law, both are Moabites, and she encourages both of them to go back to their father's homes. She says, go back to your father's homes, and hopefully you, know, you could have a life there. What is so interesting is this. 
that while Orpha, one of her daughters-in-law, decides to go back to her father's house and to her gods, Ruth chooses to stay with Naomi. And many of us are aware of those familiar words of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Let me read that for us. This is what Ruth tells Naomi. Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. And your God, my God. Verse 17, where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything, but death parts you and me. So Ruth makes this choice. I'm going to go with Naomi. And it's not just a sense of kinship that I want to stay with my mother-in-law. But she's made a powerful choice. She says, your God will be my God. Now remember, a Moabite is not allowed to enter the house of the Lord. But Ruth is saying, your God will be my God. And I'm sure Ruth did not know about this. But Isaiah the prophet, several hundreds of years later, prophesied of a, of a coming day. I'm reading from Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7. He said, there's coming, there's coming a day. He says, the sons of the foreigner, that includes the Ammonites, the Moabites, and everybody else, who joined themselves to the Lord, to serve Him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all. Nations, for all nations. Ruth didn't know it. But she was stepping in. She was calling upon a plan that God already had in his heart. That every person, if they would come under the living God, they would be welcome. In the house of the Lord. And that curse that was upon them, upon the Moabites, is removed. So the curse is removed when a person turns to the living God. And Ruth didn't know it, but she was really drawing on that truth. So, Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem, and the account goes in Ruth towards the end of chapter 1 and uh, on in chapter 2, that when they arrived in Bethlehem, it was the time of the barley harvest. So this was somewhere in the Hebrew or the Jewish month of Nisan, which is somewhere around March and April, right about this time. It was a time of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the Feast of the Passover on the day on which Jesus himself was crucified. And three days later, the Feast of the First Fruits, the Barley Harvest. And that's the time Naomi and Ruth arrive in Bethlehem. And another thing that God had instituted in the life of the community of Israel was during harvest time, 
The poor were allowed to enter into the harvest fields and gather up any grain that fell to the ground as the reapers were working in the fields. This was a way to take care of the poor in the land. Also, by this time, whatever property Naomi had, and we don't know exactly when this happened, but she sold whatever property she had. It was sold. And so here they were, when they returned to Bethlehem, I'm sure Naomi would have told Ruth, Ruth, there's one thing we can do. That is, gather the grain that falls in the fields. And being a virtuous woman, Ruth herself goes out to gather grain in the fields. The grain that falls to the ground left for the poor of the land to come and pick up. And as she does this day after day, at some point, she wanders into the fields of a man named Boaz. And by this time, news has gone around Bethlehem that Naomi has returned, but her life is in such a tragic situation. And Naomi chose to name herself Mara, meaning my life has become so bitter. I've lost everything. My husband, my sons, my property. So in Bethlehem, Naomi is known as this helpless, hopeless, and unfortunate widow. But yet, she has this daughter-in-law, Ruth, who is a Moabite, who has made the choice to come with her. And has made the choice to come under the wings of the God of Israel. And this daughter-in-law is working or gathering grain in the fields. So one day Boaz notices Ruth. And he inquires about her. And finds out who she is. That she is this virtuous daughter-in-law of Naomi. And so Boaz extends great favor towards Ruth. He tells his men, he says, you know, purposely drop some extra grain for her. Just making sure that she has more than enough to carry back home every day. And soon Naomi finds out that Ruth is working or gathering grain in the fields of Boaz. And that's when Naomi realizes maybe God has not left us hopeless. She remembers the role of a redeeming relative. And she knows Boaz is one of those closest relatives to Elimelech, her husband. And he has the opportunity to step in and be the kinsman redeemer. And so she advises Ruth, saying, Ruth, now you've got to go and make a demand. So the story goes how Ruth approaches Boaz and says, take me under your wings. Here's what she tells as he appeals to Boaz in Ruth chapter 3 and verse 9. He, that's Boaz, said to ask, so who are you? And so she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. You are a kinsman redeemer. In other words, I want you to fulfill your obligation as a redeeming relative. And Boaz, being a man of integrity, he goes through the steps. There is one more relative who's who's closer than he. And so he gives him the first option, the right to redeem. He declines it. And so now 
rightfully it becomes his option. And Boaz steps in to be the redeeming relative, the kinsman redeemer. He buys back the property that belonged to Naomi, which would have gone to her sons. He buys that back. He marries Ruth. And from that union, they have a son whose name is Obed. And you read about that great redemption that happened there in Ruth chapter 4 verse 17. Also the neighbor, neighbor women gave him a name saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. That he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So Naomi became the great, great grandmother of King David. Ruth, the Moabite, becomes the grandmother of King David. And in Matthew's Gospel, in the first chapter, there are only four women mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. And one of them is Ruth. Think about the redemption that took place in the life of Naomi and Ruth. At one point, they were completely Hopeless and helpless. Nothing. In fact, Naomi changed her name. The meaning of the word Naomi means my pleasant one. She changed her name and said, my name is Mara, bitter. Life has become so bitter. I've lost everything. Nothing to look forward to. But in that moment, Something God instituted changed not only her life, but even that of Ruth. And the redemption was so great that through that kinsman redeemer, through the redemption that took place, through the redeeming relative Boaz, comes King David. And comes the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. What is so interesting is this in the Old Testament is that same Hebrew word that is translated kinsman redeemer. And I may not be pronouncing Hebrew correctly, it, it goes something like Goel or G double. G-A-W-A-L, so Goel or something like that. <laughs> but that same Hebrew word that's used for kinsman redeemer, that same word is used for God. Saying God is your kinsman redeemer. There are several places in the Old Testament where you read about this. I'll just read a few. In uh, Psalm 78, verse 35, it says, Then they rem remembered the God that, who was their rock, and the Most High God, their Redeemer. God our kinsman redeemer. Psalm 103, verse 4, very familiar psalm to many of us. Who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Isaiah 43 and verse 1. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. And the same word, gal, 
that is used in relationship to God and his redemptive work says God is your kinsman redeemer. He redeems you out of Egypt. He brought you out of Egypt. He redeems you from all your destructions. He redeems you from all, all difficult situations. He brings you out. He is your kinsman redeemer. So the book of Ruth, the Bible does not say it's a typology, meaning it's, we cannot ascribe Boaz as Jesus and you know, Ruth as you and me and Naomi. So that typology we do not do. But it's a great illustration of what? Of the redemption that comes into people's lives through a kinsman redeemer. God is our kinsman redeemer. And Jesus coming into this world to die on the cross is that great redemptive work of a kinsman redeemer. Now think about this. Each one of us, all of us, were helpless Hopeless and lost. Everything in our lives was lost. And I'm talking primarily spiritually. We had sinned against God, all of us. We've done wrong things and our sins have separated us from God. The Bible says that God is so holy that our sins became this big barrier, separated us from God. We were hopeless without hope. We were outside of God's presence. And our sins put us in subjection to sin, Satan, and death. Separated us from the blessings of God and subjected us to sin, Satan, and eternal death. And the sad part is, there was no kinsman available who could redeem us. Because all our kinsmen were in the same situation. All our kinsmen, meaning every other human person, was in that same place of helplessness and hopelessness. None of our kinsmen could help us. They didn't have the capacity to help us. We were all lost equally. And this is where our minds cannot fathom. That this great, infinite, powerful, omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent God would choose to become our kinsman. That this infinite God would somehow become a finite man in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that he became like us, like his brethren. He stepped in to become our kinsman. Our closest relative. He said, I'll be one of you. And then he paid the price. And in this case, the price was his own life. And that's what happened on the cross. When Jesus Christ died on the cross. He paid the price. He was paying the ransom. He was paying whatever it took to buy back everything that was lost. To redeem everything that had been squandered and wasted and taken over 
by an oppressor called Satan. He paid a price to redeem us, to bring us back. And here again, our minds cannot fathom, words cannot describe what Jesus did. And after Jesus died on the cross and paid the price, he said, it is finished, it is done. The Bible tells us he was buried. Three days later, he rose up from the dead. He showed himself alive to his disciples and he ascended into heaven and he said, here's the good news. He told his disciples to go proclaim the good news saying, anyone who believes in him, who comes under his wings, will be welcome into the family of God. We who were in a land that was totally separated from God, hopeless and helpless, abandoned, lost in sin, subject to sin and Satan and eternal death, that because of what Jesus Christ did, by simply believing in him, we would be brought into the very presence of God. And the price Jesus paid is more than sufficient to redeem everything about our lives. I just want to read Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. It says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. He became our kinsman. He shared in the same. He stepped in to become part of us. That through death, and that's what he did on the cross, that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. The devil was our oppressor, dominated our lives. But on the cross and through his death, Jesus destroyed the one who had the power of death, that is the devil. And released those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For, for indeed, it, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. He's here to help us. He's here to help you and me. Worship team, could you please come? So this morning, I want you to know that Jesus Christ came to be your kinsman redeemer. And his redemption, his re work of redemption covers everything. The spiritual and the natural covers everything. He is your kinsman redeemer. Each one of us sitting here, every person watching online, you need a redeemer. We need a redeemer. Because we have sinned. None of us sitting here can say I'm without sin. We've all done wrong. In thought, word, and deed. We have done things that are against a holy God. And our sin has made us subject to sin itself, to Satan and death. And in one or more ways, we need to experience redemption. For all of us, we need to be redeemed from our sins. We need to have our sins forgiven. We need to be brought into this relationship with God. For some of us, we may need redemption in other areas of our lives. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's physical. Maybe it's emotional. There are other areas of our lives that have been oppressed, taken over by an oppressor. And we are suffering under the hand of an oppressor. But there's good news. Jesus Christ came to be your kinsman redeemer. He chose to become the one closest to you. So that he can redeem you. 
The question is, this morning, will you and I say, Lord Jesus, I come under your wings. Meaning, I come under you. Take me under your wings. Lord Jesus, I choose to believe in you. I choose to believe in who you are. Because when we believe in him, then the price he paid for the forgiveness of our sins, for the redemption of our souls, for the redemption of our entire lives becomes effective. It begins to work in our lives. And you and I can experience his redeeming work. Before we partake of the Lord's table, I want to give us an invitation. Anyone inside the auditorium, anyone watching online, first of all, if you're not sure that you've been forgiven of your sins, that you've been brought into the family of God, that you are a child of God, you're a son and a daughter of God, if you're not sure that, if you, that you are in relationship with God, but you heard this morning, that the reason Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago is to make that possible. To make it possible for you and me to come into the family of God. To have our sins forgiven. To become children of God. If there's anyone here in the auditorium or those watching online, if you're not sure that your sins are forgiven, that you are in the family of God, that you're under the wings of the Almighty, if you're not sure, I want to lead us in a simple prayer. I want to invite you to make that decision. It's as simple as making a choice. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where it all starts. That's how it all begins. I want to invite us to please bow our heads in prayer. I'm going to lead us in a simple prayer. And if you've never done this before, but this morning, seated inside this auditorium or watching live online, you want to say yes to Jesus Christ. Because He is the only one who could save you and me. There is no other kinsman who could do that for us. This is God who became a man, who died on the cross for you and me, paid the price so that our sins could be forgiven and we could be brought into the family of God. The Bible says anyone who believes in Him receives forgiveness of sins through his name and if you want to do that right now if you want to believe in him and receive that redemption from your sins I want to invite you to just pray this simple prayer with me Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me on the cross. I believe you shed your blood for me. You came to be my kinsman redeemer. I receive you into my life. Forgive my sins. And bring me into the family of God. And help me follow you. And you alone. The rest of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is anyone here in the auditorium, 
And you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. We just want to celebrate with, with you. We just want to recognize what an important decision you've made in praying that prayer and saying, Jesus, I'm coming under your wings. If you did that for the very first time, would you, if you don't mind, just wave your hand at me so I, I can know that there are people in the auditorium who prayed with me. Anyone? Can I see any hands here? Anybody? Pray that prayer with me for the very first time. Okay. I don't see any hands here inside the auditorium. If there's anyone who did that for the very first time and you're watching online, why don't you just share that on the chat? Just let people know that you did that. We want to celebrate with you knowing that you have made the choice to personally receive what Jesus did for you as your kinsman redeemer. We're going to prepare our hearts to partake of the Lord's table at this time. And uh, I hope all of us have brought the elements that as you came in, you pick the elements up. In case there's anyone here who you didn't do that and you need to have the elements brought to you, just raise your hands up and uh, we will make sure uh, these are brought to you. Right. If there's anyone here and you need that. Okay. I think everyone's already. I think so. there's somebody there at the back or there. Thank you. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to partake of the Lord's table. And then we're going to pray where I want us to receive by faith whatever Jesus came to provide for us as our kinsman redeemer. We read there in Psalm 103 verse 4. He redeems your life from destruction. He redeems. See, as your kinsman redeemer, what does he do? He redeems your life from destruction. And he crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. That's what the kinsman redeemer does. He takes us out of our helpless, hopeless state of destruction. And he brings us to this place where he crowns our life loving kindness and tender mercies. That's the blessing that the kinsman redeemer brings for us. So when we partake of these elements, I want you to do it meaningfully. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to be my kinsman redeemer. I mean, you stepped into me, into my world, and you became the closest one to me in order to redeem me. Thank you for doing that. And then I want you to say, Lord, I receive the blessings of my redemption. He redeems my life from destruction. Is there anything? Is there anything? That the devil is doing to destroy your life physically financially whatever I want you to pray and say Lord I receive the blessing of my kinsman redeemer you didn't do this in vain you did it to redeem my life from destruction and to crown me with loving kindness and tender mercies so I'm receiving it the price that the kinsman redeemer had to pay for your redemption has already been done. It's done. Now you and I step in and say, take it. Jesus is your kinsman redeemer. So let's pray over these elements. And remain seated after we partake we're going to rise up and we'll worship for a few moments Father we thank you 
that you, O oh God, are our kinsman redeemer. Jesus, you are our kinsman redeemer. When we sanctify these earthly elements of bread and grape juice, and even for those watching online, wherever they are, and Lord, as we partake of these elements, we are saying that we receive the full benefits of our redemption. We receive the blessings that you provided for us as our kinsman redeemer, Lord Jesus. You redeem our life from destruction and you crown us with loving kindness and tender mercies. You forgive us all our sins. You heal us of all our diseases. Our youth is renewed like the eagles. You satisfy our mouth with good things. Lord Jesus, we receive the blessings of what you provided for us as our kinsman redeemer. And I ask, Lord God, that as we partake of these elements, that whatever work needs to be done in the lives of people, let it be done. For those who need healing, God, in their body or minds, let miraculous healing take place. That those who need redemption from destructions in their lives, let that take place. Those who need to be brought out of difficult situations, God set things in motion to bring them out of those situations. Let every life be crowned with loving kindness and tender mercies, we pray. The Lord Jesus said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread together, please. The Lord Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant that is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. This blood is the redemption price. Our kinsman redeemer has paid the price. For our redemption. As we drink this cup, we are saying, Lord, I receive the full blessings of your redemptive work. I receive it. Let's partake of the cup together. Let's rise to our feet, please. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to cast. And suffered and died alone He took my sin and my sorrows He made them His very own He bore the burden 
to Calvary and suffered and died step in to become one of us, not just one of us, but the closest one to us. Amen? And to redeem us. When nobody else could help us, the God of this universe stepped in and became your redeeming relative. Amen. Our minds cannot understand, our, our words cannot capture the, the greatness, the, the magnitude of what God did in becoming our kinsman redeemer. Amen. But I want us this morning to say, I take, I receive what he 
died to provide for me. He redeems my life from destruction. And he crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. Let's say this out together. Lord Jesus, you are my kinsman redeemer. You are my redeeming relative. Because of you, I have been redeemed. My life has been redeemed from destruction. I am crowned with loving kindness and tender mercies. My mouth is filled with good things. My sins are forgiven. My body is healed. My life is redeemed. Because Jesus, let's say it loudly, because Jesus is my kinsman redeemer. Let's say it again. My life is redeemed. My sins are forgiven. My body is healed. My life has been set free. Because Jesus is my kinsman redeemer. Amen. Amen. Let's give him a good hand of praise. Lord Jesus, we declare your redemption. We declare your work of redemption over every life of God, over every life. Let the power of your redemption, let the power of your redemption come in every life, in every life, spirit, soul, and body, we declare we are the redeemed of the Lord. We declare that we are the blessed of God. We have been redeemed. That Satan has no place in us, no claim over us, no authority over us. Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, has redeemed us. The work is done. And so we are blessed spirit soul and body god has crowned us with loving kindness and tender mercies and that's what we will live in that's what we will walk in that's our blessing amen we're going to close today but continue to think about it meditate on it I, f- I don't feel like, and I feel like talking for another hour. <laughs> Just trying to explain. <laughs> trying to explain how great of work God did for us. But I'm going to keep quiet. I'm going to let you think about it. You think about it. God became my relative, my closest relative in order to redeem me. Whatever I lost, whatever I lost, He came into my world. He came into your world to get it back. Just ponder, just think about it and give Him thanks. Amen? Let's close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit. Continue with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources including sermons, sermon notes, publication, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcbiblecollege.org. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play Store.